from Coca-Cola, the global director for women's economic empowerment. Please welcome Charlotte Odes, and also from HP, the VP of Social Environmental Innovation, and somebody who, if you were here last year, you would have seen win the DLD Women Impact Award, Gabby Ziedelmeier. And I'm going to start with um, what Coca-Cola's doing, Charlotte. Now, there's a big initiative that's a 10-year initiative called 5 by 20. Why don't you tell us what the plan is and where it's got to? It's a pleasure. Thank you very much for inviting me here to DLD. 5 by 20 is uh, a global, our global initiative to enable the economic empowerment of five million women entrepreneurs. We talk about it being across our global value chain by 2020. And what we mean by that is that it's businesses that are either already owned or maybe it's small businesses that women want to set up that are not formed yet that somehow touch our business. These are businesses that are outside the four walls of our company but they somehow touch it. They might be farmers that you heard Kate talk about. They might be suppliers. They might be small shopkeepers in little neighborhood stores. They might be artisans that are making things from recycled packaging. All of them have one thing in common. They face barriers to business success. And what 5 by 20 seeks to do is address those. And the work that we've done says there are really three core areas of focus that are very common that these women face, which is lack of access to business building skills, lack of access to finance or assets, and lack of access to, to peer networks or mentors. And one woman may have need all of those things, or she may just need one of those. And what we do is we obviously don't work on our own. We work with partners. We work with the local communities to really understand the cultural challenges and social barriers that these women face to getting those skills. We work with NGOs. We work with governments. We work with partner like, partners like the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. We work with UN Women as one of our global partners. And we work with TechnoServe and International Finance Corporation, for example. And what we do is we put in place programs that are really as relevant, as impactful as we can make them collectively by bringing our skills collectively together to do that. We started two years ago um, in four countries, which was Brazil, India, South Africa, and the Philippines. And we're now already in 12 countries, and we have so far on our journey enabled 300,000 women we still have a long way to go to get to the five million, but our aim is to create a really sustainable legacy that will endure. And this isn't about, uh, I would say, sort of checkbook philanthropy. It's not ad hoc. This is about really making sure that we can provide enabling programs that will build those capabilities and capacities for the long term so we can really make a difference. So Charlotte, we'll talk in a minute about some of the specific challenges and some of the lessons you've learned. Um, but I want to bring in Gabby from HP. It's a country, it's a 170 country business. You've got 330,000 employees. Where do you see HP able most to make a difference? Okay, well, first I want to say it's hard to believe that two weeks ago we were afraid that we would have snow here today. It's a little bit hot. It's amazing. Um, beautiful, beautiful setting here. Glad to be here, um, to be back at DLD Women. Um, HP is uh, a technology company, and we think we need to bring the stuff that we do to solve some of the social and environmental problems. Other companies bring, like Coca-Cola, can bring very different skills and knowledge and characteristics to the play. So for us, it's to really build out showcases in the area of mobility and security, uh, cloud, very important, and also big data. So what we do in general is we work very closely with nonprofit organizations and the government, because if you don't do that, you can't scale and you can't really develop the programs. 
One of our recent prog programs um, was launched in India, and what we did is we equipped basically shipping containers. So just imagine two shipping containers that you can fly in anywhere. You can bring them via helicopter or ship or train. And you put medical equipment in it. And you make a health clinic out of that. So in India, in a country where 800 million people do not have access to basic health care, you put such a clinic in the middle of nowhere, somewhere you know, where you have a number of villages. You then connect all of these devices with the cloud. So first of all, people that never had access can be treated. But also, the government understands also what the biggest issues are. There were some real big surprises for the government already where they need to really take action and prioritize. And we've talked to, to like one woman that said, I've had arthritis all my life. It was just the biggest pain. You know, you, you wake up in the morning with pain and you go to bed with pain. And based on the fact that she was diagnosed because the health center connects to doctors in cities so they don't have to travel 3,000 miles. They do remote diagnostics and then the health worker treats the patients on location. So that together with the education centers, which we also put into these type of containers and we deployed right next to the health center. And here you have thin clients, again connected to the cloud, that enable these kids to get access to all of these massive open online content that's available out there, all of a sudden you have education and health for these kids that you've never had before, and it's really game changing. And Gabby, you're, you're working you know, on education, on environment, on health, you're working with hospitals and on instant infant HIV yep. projects. Difficulty is, I guess, in a big corporation, how you get the boss behind it, because without the boss behind it, it must be hard to have integrity in yeah. the campaign. So I think, for me, it's, it's what I really liked about HP, and which I really think is really important that this is part of your DNA, and our founders, Bill Hewlett and Dave Packard, said 75 years ago that companies need to exist beyond developing shareholder wealth, that they need to create a value for society. That's very, very important. But of course you need to live that throughout the years. They, they said that 75 years ago. What, the, the reasons why we engage are manifold. First of all, to create that type of social impact that we've just discussed, but at the same time, we build reputation, and we see that in all of the studies, how well customers, you know, customers actually expect you to really show up in these places. We also really help develop new products. You mentioned the early infant diagnosis. That's a project that we started in Kenya. And what we did together with the Clinton Health Access Initiative is we went into Kenya and we said, where can technology make a difference? And we realized that when babies are born, their blood gets taken and gets really checked for HIV. It took up to half a year for the blood to be returned to the mother and the child, which is about five months too late. So we went in with the IT architects and basically did an assessment and installed a system that allows for those results to come back within 18, 19 days. So now the Ministry of Health has seen what we can do, and this, is, this has become basically a showcase, a reference case for HP. They say, wow, you know, these guys um, really have a broad portfolio. We also developed a 3G printer in order to enable those that live far away to get the results via SMS. So it's a business case as much, really, as it is um, providing social impact. So both of you are trying to find a metric for measuring the success. I know, Charlotte, you know, you've got these stats that you collect that in Nigeria, 200,000 retailers have been trained in um, India. A certain number of solar coolers, the eco-cool coolers, have been put out of the field. But how do you, day by day, judge how well things are going? Is it simply by 2020, if you haven't got the five million, you failed? No, I think it's, it's much broader than that. So I think what having a, a really ambitious goal like five million does is it really focuses you on making sure that you are really pushing to make sure that you've got everything possible happening. But we look at it in, in, in three ways. We look at one, making sure that we have really transparent metrics of our progress. So actions of our progress are literally how many women have we you know, have participated in training programs, have had and received access to loans, et cetera. So we track that. And we only track the woman. 
We don't count every single enabling activity she receives because we are counting enabled women towards that five million. So we don't triple count her, as it were. Um, we thought the most important thing, though, is to then look at what's the long-term impact. And obviously, depending on the kind of business she's in or the kinds of um, enabling activities she's received, um, that can vary. Obviously, uh, you know, Alice, who I met in, in, um, in, in Kenya, who has a mango farm, who's learning how to grow mangoes and is now chairwoman of her, her local group, cooperative group, we, obviously it took her longer to be able to grow profitable mangoes that then we helped get the right market price for and are now taking into juices that we've just launched in Kenya. That's different from the ripple effect that might happen to um, a wonderful woman I met in, in Brazil. So, Regina, I just came back from Brazil. I spent some time in Rio and in the Amazon. And, you know, Regina is this warm-hearted, you couldn't meet somebody who was more warm-hearted, but she lives in a favela in the middle of Rio, which is a very difficult environment. She lost her son. She had no skills to actually set up a business. And she started literally just collecting litter off the streets. And she started to recycle because she, her driving force was trying to clean up her community. We worked with her to provide business skills, help give access to designers to help make this litter into beautiful items. This is just one of the bags that she now sells. We now have teams of artisans that have been enabled through the program. And Regina now employs 10 people. 700 families in the community are supported by the program. And she now has been able to buy a house. The house is actually just outside the favela, but she still goes into the favela every single day because she says that's where her soul lives. And this necklace I'm wearing is another example of just recycled packaging that was, is now being made in the Amazon. So there's just, you know, the whole ripple effect is what you need to measure. And so we have put long-term tracking in place um, to measure the impact, not just for the woman, but the extraordinary impact that she then has, not only on the investment back in her family as education, but into what happens then with that community. Because unless you have a thriving community, you will never have a thriving business so for her or for the community. These are all very inspiring stories, but I'm going to play the hard-nosed journalist for a minute here. You both represent publicly listed companies that are there to boost shareholder value. Isn't this really just part of the PR story for the company? Answer that. Absolutely not. Um, I think, yeah, as, as Gabby's already referenced for HP, I mean, when I, for the Coca-Cola company, and I have been with the company a long time, it's in our DNA that you, you absolutely know that whilst we may be well known for our global brands, we are absolutely a local business. We live and work and we produce all of the beverages in the local environment. We source locally, we hire locally. So unless you have a thriving local community, you absolutely cannot have a business that thrives. And to empower women and invest in women who are pillars of the local community and are also in many instances pillars of our business, then you know that that's gonna work. So, for me, it is absolutely part of our DNA that we do this. And I don't think there's anyone that you would talk to within our own company that wouldn't understand that and believe that too. So Gabby, you're talking about e-health centers, mobile health centers in India. You're talking about e-learning through e-books. I mean, that's promoting what HP does. That's boosting the bottom line. It certainly does. But you know, just coming back to the other question, I don't think we have a choice. I really don't think we have a choice but to, to really understand that we have to embed what we call sustainability and call it whatever you want, you know, looking after people, looking after the planet, looking after these resources because they're not endless and they're not going to be around. And we know with so many of the resources that if we continue the way we, do, we, we act right now, you know, we, we're not going to have any of these discussions. We're not going to actually meet in this type of an environment. 
So, so I think you know, it's, it's really time, not only for corporations, but for individuals to wake up and to understand it's not good enough to just listen to what's going on. People need to walk out of here and think about what that means for them and what a difference you know, that needs to make in their lives. And I think for us, and that comes back to your question now, that is very important because that's what we're trying to convey also to our employees. We have 330,000 employees, employees that highly sought after in the world. If you want a time to, to your company, you have to have a common purpose. And we're really trying to rally around solving some of these big social issues as the rallying cry. Why would I work rather at HP than at any other company? There have to be some values there. There has to be something I inherently believe that HP is doing better than other companies. And so what we're trying to do is, is get all of them, 330,000 people involved to, to really you know, use their skills, use not only the technology, but what they do best to take a look at, do I need to do something online? Do I need to get in with you know, mentoring, coaching? Or do I just look in my own backyard and help a kid that might have just come here from some country and, and help that kid to really you know, develop a perspective and and, and you know, later on, he or she might, might have a high school degree and otherwise would have never had it. I mean, how great a feeling is that? So there are measurable benefits inside Absolutely. the company on boosting morale and on a sense that, of purpose. I think there are really good metrics on boosting the morale and what okay. it means to employees. But coming back to your other question on metrics, it's not good enough. It definitely isn't good enough. I mean, you know, companies are, that are metrics driven and that really have algorithms for everything in the social space, our metrics do not hold up to many of these, um, you know, basically, you know, it, it, it's, we don't run a P&L, basically. Um, we can approximate, you know, and we try to approximate, and in some of these uh, programs, like Charlotte has said, we set some goals, like with the early infant diagnosis, we, want, we now have reached 250,000 kids, and now we set new goals because we want to reach many, many more. But a return on, on your social investment is very different and very difficult to calculate. So. Right now, what we do is approximate at best. So a couple of years ago, a lot of companies would set up their corporate social responsibility office, which would be on a different floor from the executives, the and it would be kind of slightly away from the center. Um, how do you ensure that these sorts of socially beneficial initiatives are central to the company? Well, certainly for the Coca-Cola company, we build it into a, the whole business framework. So we have a, a very simple framework, which is me, we, the world, which is about well-being. Women is the absolute focus of the community pillar for we, and the world is all of the work we do environmentally. It is hardwired into our business, because I think that's the only way you can truly make it sustainable. It's the reason why, as we look at empowering women, we always try to find that connection back to the business because if we grow, we help them grow and vice versa. And I think it's the only way you can truly make something sustainable. So we have metrics, so accountability is really important. Um, there has to also be you know, belief, which we talked about before. And you know, as Gabby's referenced, you know, this groundswell that comes, there's just incredible pride from the people who work inside the company with these kinds of initiatives, they want to do more. They want to contribute. They're proud of what we're able to do. And they can see the difference that it makes, obviously with our partners. So we do this collectively. And every single program is designed to have the optimal impact at the local community level so that we can really make that difference. So at HP, does this have buy-in from the very top? Absolutely. Absolutely. It has buy-in from... Uh, Meg Whitman and the executive council. I'm working with the entire HR team now and making sure that it's absolutely core to any development in the company. So if you want to develop in the company, this is going to be part of your curriculum rather than just go out and take these standard courses, which oftentimes there's nothing wrong with taking a course at the London Business School or Harvard. All of those are fine. But what we want to do is get people more involved, get them out of their comfort zone, get them involved in these type of programs where they deal 
with very different settings. I mean, if you go out and you work with nonprofits and governments for the first time, they work very differently from the way we do. And it really is a phenomenal learning experience and for those people to go out and then see how they can drive results and accountability, this is very, very important. So we built that now into the entire development program at HP. So we want to encourage some other people who have um, corporate roles here to start thinking, maybe we should be doing things along these lines. Um, but as we have two people who have lots of experience of this on stage, and, and as we're in an entrepreneurial culture where admitting your failures is actually a pat on the back thing, be a bit honest about some of the things that you've done that haven't worked, some of the lessons that you've learned from things that have gone wrong. Yeah, okay. Well, for us, it was with all the enthusiasm. I think we've taken on way too many things and we let some of the management slip. Some of these pieces really need to be tightly managed and it also means you need to spend enough time and give it enough time for the program to come to fruition. And we were just a little bit naive, probably, thinking that we weren't going to make this investment, this is going to happen, you know, here is our goal for next quarter, and it just didn't happen that way. So you gotta, you got to give it a lot more time and you also, at the end of the day, you can try a few things, but then it needs to come back to more focus because we've also put out money to some programs where I think we could have used it in a better way had we, had we done less, basically. So it's, it's a good learning. I think um, you know, the, the whole genesis for the 5 by 20 initiative was you know, when our chairman and CEO invited you know, a, a, a 16 women from around the world to form the Women's Leadership Council to advise the business and the operating committee on how to develop women into more senior leadership roles and really develop the pipeline. And it was through doing that work that we then said, we want to actually help not just women who are inside the four walls, but outside the four walls of our business as well. And we work very hard to create a business case for that. And I think if I were to roll the clock back now, I would say I think we spent too long creating the business case, which actually got immediate support. Um, and we should have just moved swift, more swiftly into implementation and making it happen. And as I look at some of the work on the ground that we do, I think, I think making sure that you work with the other partnerships that we work with, you know, be it UN Women, be it Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, whoever it is, just making sure that you really are working with and listening all the time to the incredible insights that they bring. We may be able to bring very local insights, very strong business insights and experiences, but there are undoubtedly other partners that need to be at the table that bring you those as well to make sure that the programs that you have developed are really and truly scalable and are not going to cause unintended consequences, um, which, you know, in some cultures, you know, that's possible if you really don't have the best information. So those are the sorts of things we tend to focus more on now. So there's a lot of empirical evidence that companies that show they have a social purpose as well as a business purpose boost the bottom line um, Patagonia and Zappos and Tom Shoes, there's a whole bunch of them. Um, so as a last question, if we want people here to go back home afterwards and start to think, how can we in our workplace start acting, not just thinking, acting along these lines, how should they start? I think there are, there are so many different ways nowadays, especially since not everything is physical anymore. There are many virtual platforms, depending on the country where you are, where you can start getting engaged. And I, I would think that in an area where you feel comfortable coaching and giving advice and using an online platform, because then there is no excuse that you can't be at a certain place physically and you don't have the time, is a very, very good place to start. I mean, thank God for the internet. Uh, it's pretty easy to find some well-established um, organizations, non-profit organizations that are out there that are looking for ongoing support. So if people want to make the commitment, and I think everybody that steps out of this room should, think about it long-term, not just something that you're going to do and try out, but really stick with it and do it for long-term to make a huge difference. I think it, it, it online would be my, my advice. Charlotte? I think... Um if I, in terms of the economic empowerment of women and just empowering women, I think always start inside the organization first. 
there's no point in going outside to help other people unless you have looked, really looked at your own internal processes and procedures and what you're doing for women inside the organization. And if what you're doing isn't right, then be prepared to stand up for what you believe in and make that known. And I think that's a really important starting point. And if the Coca-Cola thing doesn't work out, you could always go into product placement, which is the most <laughs> masterful positioning of a bottle of drink over there. Um, I was going to bring my PC. <laughs> we're going to go into a break in a minute. So I just want to say, lastly, um, to our optimists with a mission here, um, to Gabby and to Charlotte and to Kate, please can we show some appreciation? Thank you. Thank you.